This will be the first of several podcasts on the cytoskeleton, and this first podcast will give you a quick overview of the cytoskeleton and then talk about microtubules. Now you're learning objectives. You should be able to recognize components of the cytoskeleton on electron micrographs, and you should be able to explain the structure and function of the cytoskeleton as it relates to specialized histology. So for example, as it would relate to the histology of muscle cells or to neurons, or to how it would relate to stages of the cell cycle. That is comparing the cytoskeleton in an interphase cell versus a cell that's going through division. The cytoskeleton is part of the non-membranous organelle systems of cells, and we can talk about several components of the cytoskeleton. We'll talk about some general principles and some functions. So the components of the cytoskeleton will be microtubules. These are hollow tubes that are composed of tubulin molecules. Centrioles, which are paired cylindrical structures at the centrosome, the so-called microtubular organizing center. And then there are two classes of filaments that are involved in the cytoskeleton. There are microfilaments, a good example would be actin, these are helical polymers, and then there are intermediate filaments, two prime examples would be keratins and vimentins, these are rope or cable-like fibers. If we look at just some general principles of the cytoskeleton, we can say that the cytoskeleton consists of networks of proteins. The assembly of the cytoskeleton requires polymerization. The cytoskeleton, by and large, consists of very dynamic structures, at least from the perspective of microtubules and microfilaments. These are very dynamic structures. The cytoskeleton supports cytoplasmic activities, so things that might relate to cell signaling and metabolic activity might relate to the cytoskeleton, and the cytoskeleton also supports movement. So that would be the cell moving, cell surface appendages moving, and the cytoskeleton also provides the machinery for organelle movement and localization within the cell. These functions have been likened by some people to saying that the cytoskeleton might be the bones of the cell and the muscles of the cell. These images, they're just pretty pictures, but they're of the same cell, probably a fibroblast, and they're just stained with different antibodies to highlight the intermediate filaments. In this case, the antibody is to vimentin. That's shown on the left. An antibody to microtubules, shown on the middle. And then an antibody to actin, so-called microfilaments, shown on the far right. Now let's just talk about microtubules for the remainder of this podcast. Microtubules are non-branching, rigid, hollow tubes that can rapidly disassemble in one location and reassemble in another location. And here, in an electron micrograph of the mitotic spindle, you can see microtubules. They're highlighted by the arrows on this image, and you can see profiles of chromosomes. Here, microtubules are shown in the axon of a neuron. Microtubules can be found in interphase cells that be found at the centrosome and that be radiating out towards the cortical cytoskeleton. That's shown in this cartoon. Microtubules are also found in dividing cells as pericentriolar material and in the spindle apparatus. That's shown here. And microtubules are in ciliated cells in the basal body, the microtubular organizing center of the microtubules that are going up into the cilia. Here we're showing microtubules visualized by fluorescence microscopy. You have an interphase cell here. The microtubules are shown as long fibers. They're filling the cytoplasm. This happens to be from a cultured cell that's stained with a fluorescent antitubulant antibody. The insert shows a mitotic cell that's stained with the same antitubulant antibody, and it doesn't take much imagination to look at how completely the microtubule cytoskeleton has rearranged from an interphase cell versus a cell that's in cell division. Microtubules are elongated polymers, and they essentially consist of equal molar ratios of alpha tubulin and beta tubulin. They're rigid cylinders. They may be 20 to 25 nanometers in diameter. They consist of 13 circularly arranged globular dimeric tubular molecules that are called protofilaments. And these make up the wall of a microtubule. So in this diagram on the bottom, this would be a protofilament that I'm tracing like that. 
another protofilament like this, and there'd be 13 of these protofilaments arranged in a circle around this hollow tube. The wall is about 5 nanometers thick. The molecular weight of the alpha and beta tubulin dimer might be something on the order of 110 kilodaltons. Microtubules are very highly dynamic structures. All you have to think about is the mitotic or meiotic spindle to understand that. Microtubules can be permanent though if you think about the structure of cilia and flagella. The axoneme is essentially composed of microtubules and those are permanent structures. This cartoon just shows the microtubules. Here would be the protofilaments like this. So display just like that the protofilaments. Here you can see them in an electron micrograph in cross section and then in a longitudinal section like this. I'm going to talk in just one second about the plus end and minus end of microtubules. Microtubules polymerize in an end-to-end -end manner, sometimes called the head-to-tail or the plus end to minus end manner. So we can talk about the plus end here and the minus end here. Now this does not relate to charge in the least bit. It just is to indicate a head and a tail region. And now as this diagram shows, alpha tubulin of one dimer will bind to beta tubulin of the next dimer and this will occur in a repeating fashion and there'll be longitudinal contacts that link dimers together into the linear structure the so-called protofilament. Microtubules initially grow from gamma tubulin rings that are within the microtubular organizing center. These gamma tubulin rings within the microtubular organizing center would equal the nucleation site for alpha and beta tubule dimers. These dimers are added to the gamma tubulin ring and polymerization of the dimers requires GTP and magnesium and that's what's shown in this diagram the tubulin dimers bound to GTP like this. Here the tubulin dimers bound to GDP. The growing end of the microtubules is always the beta tubulin at the plus end of the protofilament and these can extend towards the cell periphery. The non-growing end is always at the minus end and that's always embedded or it's usually embedded within the microtubular organizing center. Polymerization and depolymerization is usually in a steady state and in an in vitro condition this polymerization and steady state can be altered with temperature. In living cells microtubular associated proteins can change the rate of polymerization and depolymerization. This just gives you an example of microtubule assembly and disassembly. So here we have nucleation at the gamma tubulin rings that's shown here in the cartoon. Notice the centriole pair that's clustered in this nucleation center or this microtubular organizing center. Elongation of the microtubules add the alpha and beta dimers on these gamma tubulins and they're going to grow out with the plus end extending out towards the cell periphery and addition of tubulin dimers occurs at this plus end so the microtubules get longer at the plus end. Interestingly though microtubules exhibit a dynamic instability as the tubules shrink you also remove dimers from the plus end. Now microtubule stabilization occurs as there are association of microtubular associated proteins at the plus end. Those proteins block the dynamic instability of microtubules and so will make the tubulin a more stable structure. The important thing to understand is that the natural state for microtubules is they want to polymerize and depolymerize very rapidly. So there's this sense of dynamic instability. This instability must be stabilized by microtubular associated proteins to lead to permanent structures. We've hinted at this in an earlier podcast. Organelle translocation within cells can occur along roadways or railroad tracks, if you want, of microtubules. And this cartoon is just showing that. And I think we've already touched on the fact that transport along these microtubules is powered by microtubular motor 
proteins. And in an axon, we talk about things going from the cell body towards the axon terminal, so-called movement in an anterograde direction, or we talk about movement going from the axon terminal back to the cell body in a retrograde direction. Whether something moves in an anterograde or retrograde direction depends on the specificity of microtubular associated motor proteins. There are two major motor proteins, one being kinesin, the other being dynein. Kinesin has a specificity of moving cargo towards the plus end of the microtubules. Dynein has the specificity of moving cargo towards the minus end of the microtubules. Both of these microtubular motors have conserved globular head regions that have ATPase activity and then the tail region binds cargo and the tail region can be highly variable which would suggest that the cargo would be variable. So the issue would be what type of cargo can be transported with these microtubular motor proteins. And as you might imagine, the cargo might be organelles like endocytic vessels, lysosomes, mitochondria. The cargo could be other microtubules. The cargo could also be chromosomes. Let's talk very briefly about cilia and flagella. Cilia and flagella have a 9 plus 2 arrangement of microtubules. Here is the electron micrograph of a ciliary axoneme. So if we're looking at a cilia, there'd be a plasma membrane that's surrounding this axoneme. So if you look at, for example, these pseudostratified columnar epithelium, you can see the cilia on the surface while the plasma membrane is coming out around each cilia, around the axoneme, just just as the plasma membrane is coming out around the sperm tail in the flagella. You may remember the structure of the axoneme, nine outer microtubule doublets. One member of the doublet is a complete tubulin with 13 protofilaments. The other member of the doublet is actually a partial tubule in that it shares some of the protofilaments with its partner. We talk about dynein arms. There's an inner and an outer dynein arm, and there are these linking proteins in the middle like this. And then there's a central doublet that has a structure of 13 protofilaments individually around each of the tubules. So you have this 9 plus 2 arrangement of the ciliary axoneme. If you look at ciliary movement, it's all about dynein, the dynein arms. Dynein moves the microtubules in the minus direction. So here, if you just had isolated microtubules in an in vitro condition, these microtubules, if you had dynein in the mix, would just walk past each other, moving towards the minus direction. If you go back and look at the structure of the ciliary axoneme, you've got these various linking proteins along these microtubules. These linking proteins allow the axoneme to bend because the microtubules are going to slide past each other with this dynein moving towards the minus direction, but they can only slide as far as these link proteins allow them to slide. So they can't totally slide off of each other, so they're going to just bend. This image shows the distribution of kinesin motor proteins on a mitotic spindle. It's basically a confocal immunofluorescent image of mammary epithelial cells, and it's a particular cell that was captured at anaphase. And you can see the pair of centrioles at each spindle pole, so here's one pair, and the pair at the opposite spindle pole. These have been stained with a monoclonal antibody to proteins that associate with centrioles in the microtubular organizing center, and it was tagged with a molecule that will fluoresce green. The red is an antibody to a mitotic kinesin. The mitotic kinesin is called EG5. You don't have to remember that, but it's stained red because the antibody was labeled with a fluorescent probe, probably rhodamine, that will fluoresce back red. So you can see this mitotic kinesin motor on these kinetochore microtubules. Kinetochores are fluorescing white because kinetochore proteins were stained with an antibody to the proteins that was labeled with a white fluorescent probe. The cystochromatids are just reflecting autofluorescence of the DNA fluorescent blue.